the next morning and back here in the mangrove and rubber plantations of the western area a few companies had fought on through the night doing their best to repel the waves of Japanese invaders but by late morning they too were in retreat that was made difficult however by the tough terrain and the fact that Japanese infantry had already penetrated their lines by 10 a.m. several thousand Japanese troops had already secured a foothold on the coast with forward units already heading along Lim Chu Kang Road here towards Tenga Airfield. Once again the Allies had been unable to keep up with the tempo of the battle. Attempts to regroup west of Tenga in the afternoon were thwarted by groups of Japanese occupying positions along the road. With chaos ruling, the defenders eventually settled on falling back to the Kranji Jurong line, effectively ceding Tenga to the invaders. With the Japanese advance guard now regrouping here at the airfield and others busy sending landing craft back across the strait ready for a second landing at Kranji later that night, the Allies now had the perfect opportunity to launch a counter-attack. However, they once again failed to take advantage thanks to poor communication, the scattering of retreating troops and the relative weakness of their backup units. Add to this continued caution by Malaya Command who failed to commit more men to the battle because of concerns over a possible attack in the east and another golden opportunity was lost. That evening at 9 p.m. the 4th Imperial Guards launched a second landing here at Kranji, an area defended by the Australians with help from the Chinese volunteer Dal Force. Named after its commander, Lieutenant Colonel John Daly, Dal Force was a unit made up of people from many walks of life, including former prisoners who had been hastily released and given minimal training. Defending the coast here, where Kranji Pier once stood, they held their own through the night against what was for once a badly organised enemy thrust. At around 4am, fuel that had been drained into the Johor Strait was purposely set alight, leading to a fire that incinerated many Japanese troops. The inferno sparked calls for the landings to be called off but leader of the Japanese forces, General Yamashita, who was having breakfast when he received the requests, quickly reassessed the situation and ordered the attack to continue. It proved to be a wise decision, as yet again, poor communication amongst those in charge saw defending units withdraw when in an advantageous position. The Kranji Jurong line, which stretched between the basins of the two rivers, was meant to be a strong defensive position from where the Allies could hold firm against the Japanese forces. However, those defensive plans were once again undone by an embarrassing failure of communication. First, Australian Brigadier H.B. Taylor misinterpreted his orders and instead of holding the line began to withdraw, sparking a domino effect of retreats in the northern region. Then, the Indian battalion guarding Jurong Road in the south got spooked by Allied reinforcements. Mistakenly believing they were being outflanked by the Japanese, they began to withdraw to Bukit Tima. By evening, this so-called defensive stronghold had collapsed without any major effort from the Japanese. With the invasion progressing steadily and Tenga airfield already in the hands of the Japanese, Yamashita was feeling confident enough to move his HQ onto Singapore Island, setting up in a rubber plantation somewhere around here, just north of Tenga. That same day, around 50 tanks that had been floated across the strait on pontoons were able to join the battle, and by midnight they had helped push the front line through what was then the village of Bukit Panjang behind me and down the road to Bukit Tima. Yamashita had initially aimed to conquer Singapore by February the 11th to celebrate the anniversary of the first Emperor of Japan's ascension to the throne. But with that goal now out of reach, he instead set his troops the task of capturing the vital high ground of Bukit Tima. By evening, with the help of the tanks and through fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, 
they had achieved that aim. The Japanese were now in control of the crucial high ground, as well as vital military fuel, food and supply dumps. With defeat now looking more and more inevitable, the RAF that night withdrew the small number of airplanes still in Singapore from here at Kalang Airfield to prevent them from falling into Japanese hands, handing complete control of the sky to the invaders. The morning of the 11th couldn't have gotten off to a worse start for General Percival, who awoke to the sound of a battle just a mile away from his headquarters here at Syme Road. With the fight now too close for comfort, he was forced to pack up and move to Fort Canning. Meanwhile, Japanese engineers had already repaired the causeway, enabling more troops and tanks to cross the strait and travel directly down Woodlands Road to join the battlefront. A concerted effort to retake Bukit Timah was repelled, leaving Allied soldiers to fall back to Percival's final defensive perimeter, a tenuous line encircling the city that stretched from Kalang Airfield to Pailabar Airstrip to Woodley Crossroads, Thompson Village, Adam Road, Farrah Road, Tangling Holt and down to the coast of Buena Vista. In addition to the loss of Bukit Timah and its vital supply dumps, a more or less fatal blow to any hopes of a prolonged defence, the 11th was also notable for a couple of incidents that led to mass casualties on the Allied side. The first involved a company of around 1,500 men who had been involved in a counter-attack to try and retake the Kranji Jurong line the previous evening. Realising they had been cut off by a Japanese thrust, they attempted to retreat, but got caught in open ground while passing through the area behind me, then known as Sleepy Valley, and a rout ensued. Only around 400 men made it back to the Allied lines. The second occurred here at Tyersall Road, when enemy aircraft dropped incendiary bombs during an attack on the 14th Indian General Hospital, situated in the grounds of the Instana Woodnook. The ATAP roofs of the huts quickly caught fire, burning alive many patients, while those who managed to escape earned only a temporary reprieve as they were repeatedly strafed by fighters. Around 700 people are thought to have perished during the attack. 